be better than all other learning algorithms for all problems. Meaning, if you're going to be the best at solving a particular problem, you have to tune your solution, tune your learning algorithm to it. Now, I've just described a system which I just say, look, it solves all these problems at once. How can that be? Well, it turns out that HTMs make a, a particular assumption about the world. They, they assume that the world itself has hierarchical structure to it. And they won't work if the world doesn't have hierarchical structure to it. There's an assumption there. Now, what do I mean the world is hierarchical structure? In both time and space. You can, hear, you can imagine the hierarchical structure in time, like in speech. I have phonemes which are combined into words, and words are combined into phrases, and phrases into ideas, and so on. Um, and, and, but it's true in vision as well. You can also imagine spatial structure hierarchy. Like, take a body. Uh, it has a torso, legs, and arms, and a head. Each of those has subcomponents. Like the head is eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. Each of those have subcomponents. And those are consistent. It's like a tree-shaped hierarchy. Turns out that's the way the world is structured, because the laws of physics makes it that way. And that's why HTMs work. They make that assumption. It's different than Turing's machine. Turing's machine said, I make no assumptions about the world. The paper tape says, you can store anything you want, anywhere, anyhow, I don't care. And it's universal. But it, you pay a cost for that, because it's not good at solving these kind of problems. And nature discovered that if you tune, build a hierarchical memory for a hierarchical world, it works. OK, I'm going to last the last few minutes of my talk just talking about the future, um, where this is all going to go. Uh, the last chapter of my book talks about this. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I'm going to give you a flavor for it. Uh, when people first design a new technology, they can never really predict where it's going to go. Uh, you go I, heard, I think Val was talking about this. I couldn't tell the words in the last speech. But you know, when they invented the first computers, they couldn't anticipate the internet. They couldn't anticipate satellites and GPS and cell phones and so on. They just couldn't. There's no way. And when, if, if HMs are as big a deal as I think they're going to be, we cannot predict where they're going to go either. Um, the first thing people always do is apply to the obvious problems, like computer vision or um, you know, language recognition and so on. We're, we're going to do all that stuff. But the interesting stuff, the really cool stuff, is going to occur later, and we can't anticipate it. But we can do the following. We can, say, well, we can put some parameters around it. For example, I can say there's no reason at all we can't make bi you know, uh, silicon-based HTMs a million times faster than biological ones. Neurons are slow. They are, they, the fastest they can do anything is about on the order of five milliseconds. And, uh, and we, can make, we can make our memories much, much faster than that, a million times faster. Well, that has a lot of advantages. It means I can solve problems I couldn't solve otherwise. I can apply to real-time data like uh, humans couldn't possibly look at. I might even want to slow it down. It gives us that flexibility. The second thing is we can experiment with architecture. Uh, you know, mammals have only been around for a while, you know, you know a fairly long time, but as in the history of all animals, not that long. And nature has experimented with several you know, varieties of these hierarchies and keeps discovering the bigger it makes them, the better it is. Um, we can do a lot of experimentation. We can, we can change the, the size of the hierarchies. We can make memories that are much, much bigger than human memories. We can apply them in different ways. We can experiment with different learning algorithms, algorithms and so on. We can do a much, much faster job, but nature has a fairly slow process of doing. So we can experiment. With, no doubt we can make these things do things that bot brains don't do very well. And the third thing is, and the th thing that's probably the most exciting for me, is that you can interface HTMs to, to, to foreign senses, like non-biological senses. We don't have to be restricted to eyes, ears, and skin. Uh, we can do infrared. We can do, um, uh, we can, we can, as I mentioned earlier, we can feed in financial data. We can feed in you know, sensors from cars and laser scanners and things like that. Um, there's a huge series of opportunities of, of, of modeling data, data discovery and causal discovery on data that humans don't interface with well. And if, if a human wants to understand any of that stuff, we have to translate it into some other pattern, like visual patterns that a human can relate to. But we can feed it directly into HDM. So I think it's a, a very, very exciting uh, technology. And uh, it's got a lot, of, a lot of future to it. I believe it's going to really represent the second generation of, of computing. And, uh, and it, it, it's, that, it's that profound. Um, I, one thing I want to point out is that it's, it's, don't worry about this stuff. This is not like robots taking over the world. Uh, well, there's a few left here, but you know, I get this all the time. Like, aren't these machines going to be, you know, resentful? Um, and you know, first of all, they, they don't replicate. They don't have emotions. It's just a box doing inference. Okay, um, you know, maybe if someone wants to try to build, you know, robot buddies or something, they can do that. But that's not what we're about. Um, and it's just a very, very useful tool. It's a very, very. It solves a lot of interesting problems uh, that we don't know any other way. Now, I want to end with just a comment about why I'm giving this talk. Um, uh, I, you know, I don't need to hear myself speak about this. Uh, the reason I give talks like this is that I'm, I'm hoping to find one or two people, maybe five, 
an audience like this who say, damn, that's cool. I want to work on that. Uh, and you can. There's a tremendous opportunity here. And the RSA people tend to be pretty smart. Um, and they might, some of you might want to go for that opportunity. Uh, it's like a whole new ball game here. Uh, you can easily do that. You can read my book. They're selling it. Uh, I signed a bunch of copies. So you can buy one if you want uh, in the bookstore. Uh, you can go to our website, download the stuff. You can play with the tools. We're having our first public workshop in June. Anyone can go to that. Uh, you can find out about that on our website. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's challenging at this point in time. It's not easy. There's a lot of things we're still figuring out as we go along. But uh, it's clear we're over the hump. So uh, with that, I'm going uh, to, before I say goodbye, uh, I am going to be taking Q&A, I guess, in the little room around the corner if anyone wants to chat for me a little bit after my talk. Uh, but other than that, I'm done. Thank you very much for your time.